Sing with me. You are a good, good, oh. 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 Let's keep going. of my heart be the mountain where I run the fountain I drink from oh he is my son let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life oh he is my son you are good good You are good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh, let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sail, the anchor in the wave. Oh, he is my son. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days. Oh, he is my son. You are good. You're never going to let, you're never going to let, never going to let me down. You're never going to let, never going to let me down. You're never going to let, never going to let me down. You're never going to let, never going to let me down. If you are good.
We are in Genesis 16, verses 1 to 6. Excellent. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him, but she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, the Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abram agreed with Sarai's proposal. So Sarai took Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abram as a wife. This happened 10 years after Abram had settled in the land of Canaan. So Abram had sexual relations with Hagar and she became pregnant. But when Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress, Sarai, with contempt. Then Sarai said to Abram, this is all your fault. I put my servant into your arms, but now that she's pregnant, she treats me with contempt. The Lord will show who's wrong, you or me. Abram replied, look, she is your servant, so deal with her as you see fit. Then Sarai treated Hagar so harshly that she finally ran away. That's all. <laughs> uh, we've been looking at Genesis for, for a while, haven't we? So where does this passage fit within the life of Abram? Here's the rough timeline. Abram was born in Ur about 4,000 years ago, and at 70, he moved his family to Haran. And then five years later, we see in Genesis 12, God calls him and says he'll become a great nation. Obeying God, Abram moves his family to Canaan. And over the next 10 years, stop, including, as Keith set out last week, God expanding on his promise to Abram. And we arrive at Genesis 16. Abram is 85 and Sarai 65, sorry, 75. Now, what is it that God is saying to us today through these six surprising verses? You know, when we read scripture, it's almost impossible for us to set aside our, our own culture, our own expectations. And because of that, if you're reading this in the 21st century, probably one of the main things that will smack you between the eyes is the polygamy. Polygamy, having more than one husband or wife, that's frowned upon in most Western societies. In fact, it's more than frowned on, it's illegal. So if we look at this passage superficially, we say, oh yes, this is anti-polygamy. I get what this passage is about. And I think we'd be wrong to say that. Here are some things we know about polygamy in the Bible. Firstly, it's never explicitly condemned. That's right. The Bible doesn't say that no one should ever have more than one husband or wife, except like Paul when he's talking about church leaders. Of course, there are a lot of things the Bible doesn't say. The Bible doesn't say, don't pull the wings of flies. And yet, most of us realize, eventually, that it's not cool to do that. So the lack of outright condemnation isn't conclusive. But we also know that in the patriarchal society of the Old Testament, the culture dominated and run by men, an unmarried woman couldn't provide for herself or protect herself. And polygamy was better than some of the alternatives for women, like prostitution, slavery, starvation. And with the amount of warfare in those times, many men were killed in battle. So there'd be times where there was an imbalance uh, in the numbers of men versus women. And right at the start, God, God told Adam and Eve, the first humans, be fruitful and multiply. And in all these circumstances, it was quicker if men had multiple wives. So if someone was reading this passage, Genesis 16, 1 to 6, 3,000 years ago, they might not bat an eyelid at the polygamy. That's not the main issue here. And before you report me to the elders, I'm not saying that polygamy is good. Of course, the first marriage was between one man and one woman, Adam and Eve, 
And when the Bible sets out guidelines for marriage, it always talks about one man and one woman, like Jesus in Matthew 19. So God's example, his perfect standard, is clear. But it's not the main thrust of Genesis 16 to comment on polygamy. What then are our lessons in this passage? We will see God's inescapable sovereignty. We're going to talk about what that means in practice, uh, particularly as it applies to childlessness, which is the underlying human in this story. And we'll see the position of trust that should follow from that sovereignty. God's all-powerful and good. The rational thing to do is to trust him. And all the more so since he makes good promises, like to Abraham. And we see God repeatedly making good on his good promises. We'll get a strong impression of human fallenness, our depravity, the tendency towards sin. All the characters in this story show this tendency. And taking these three lessons together, God's sovereignty, the importance of trusting him, and yet our sinful tendencies that break that trust, we have our fourth lesson. The consequences of failing to trust God, of usurping his sovereignty, taking matters into our own hands. So really, it's a salutary passage, one with stern warnings. Of course, where God's warnings are concerned, there's always love and grace behind them, and there's always hope. But the hope isn't actually fulfilled in these six verses. For that, you will have to stay tuned to the sermon series. Apologies for the iffy mic. Right, let's review our passage. Verse 1. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him, but she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. Sarai hadn't been able to bear children for Abram, and this was an important duty for wives, to bear children. If you look back at the curse in Genesis 3, we won't turn to it now, but do check if you need to familiarise yourself. This is after Adam and Eve have sinned. And see how God curses pregnancy for the woman, and he curses manual labour for the man. And those are two distinct roles that God identifies, and these roles are filled with strife because of Adam and Eve's sin. But pregnancy was a huge deal for women, and I dare say it still is. If we look at the passage through Old Testament eyes, there's this comment that Sarai couldn't raise a child for Abram. And if we look at the following verses, that is Sarai's view. It's about her. She's the one who hasn't had children. Of course, we know it's not her fault. But Sarai is feeling that pressure. Also, we'll just mention that Hagar, Sarai's Egyptian servant, may well, may, may well have been one of the gifts that Pharaoh gave them when they were in Egypt. Hagar's been relocated. Verse 2, So Sarai said to Abram, The Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abram agreed with Sarai's proposal. Sarai, at the age of 75, says that God has actively intervened to prevent her from falling pregnant. She says, God is sovereign. This is his design. And Sarai certainly knows that this is within the power and authority of God. But from a tone and from what she says next... She isn't happy, so she takes matters into her own hands. She says to Abram, go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. It's easy for us to say this with hindsight. We aren't in her situation, facing the pressures of her culture. So I don't want to judge her harshly. But if she really believed that God was the one preventing her from having children, then to whom should she have appealed? You're all very quiet. <laughs> she should go first to God, not her husband and servant. And so should we. 
for everything. And in this suggestion, in trying to fulfill God's promise herself, in taking to herself a duty that was God's, she starts off this massive chain of events. And we're still feeling the repercussions of this today in the conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians. But that's also for a later sermon. And Abraham agreed with Sarai's proposal. This is Abraham, remember, the man who's enjoyed unprecedented access to God Almighty, who's received a personal promise from the maker of the universe. Abraham says, okay then. But again, we don't want to be unduly harsh with Abraham. He's seen the anguish of his wife who he loves, and he wants the best for her. And so he's open to one of the risks with love. How easy it is for us to be persuaded by someone to whom we're close and who we love. Just like Adam and Eve. He's not a stupid man. Sarai is not a stupid woman. They are a couple who serve God and who are under pressure. The problem is, this pressure leads them away from complete trust in God. Anyone identify with that? When in difficult times, it isn't always our first thought to trust God. I'm certainly guilty of that. Very recently guilty, in fact. I am so grateful that God forgives again and again and again. For Abraham and Sarai, this pressure has reversed the usual direction of authority. Normally, it would be God having authority over Abraham, who in turn has authority over Sarai. But in this reversal, Sarai's authority is set over Abraham's, and his authority is set above God's. Not good. Verse 3. So Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abraham as a wife. This happened Ten years after Abram had settled in the land of Canaan. So here's a central event of the passage, the point of no return. Back to the timeline. Remember that Abram received the call of God ten years before this. God said he would make Abram a great nation. And Abram follows God's direction and moves his family to Canaan, just as God has said. So he's obeyed God and uprooted his family. But what do you think might have been going through their minds as the years ticked on? And Sarai went from 65 to 75, no children. As Abram went from 75 to 85, no children. No sign of that promised great nation appearing. No matter how much they trusted God, and Abraham is singled out in the Bible for commendation about his faith in God, no matter how much they trust God, that must have been difficult. With every year, their bodies aged. I'm nearly 50, not far off. I would not want to start a family right now. And their experience would be telling them that it's less and less likely that Sarai will fall pregnant, and if she does, that she'll be able to carry the baby to term. This isn't like waiting for a bus to arrive. The longer you wait, the more likely it will be that one arrives. This is more like you've got a constantly boiling kettle, and you're waiting for someone to come along with the tea and the milk, and yet the longer the kettle boils, the less and less water will be left, and eventually there'll be no water, It'll all have evaporated and the tea and the milk will be too late. Unless there's some kind of miracle, fertility has an expiration date. And so that's 10 years of increasing pressure for Sarai and Abram. Verse 4, so Abram had sexual relations with Hagar and she became pregnant. But when Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress Sarai with contempt. I could be wrong here, but I get the impression that Hagar conceives quite 
quickly after her marriage to Abram. So this is a double insult to Sarai. First, Hagar's taken her husband, then she's conceived with no trouble at all, and now it seems she's the mother of Abram's heir. And notice how when someone's placed in an inappropriate position, how quickly that person's attitude can deteriorate. Have you ever seen someone promoted at work, or dare I say it, be given a leadership responsibility in a church, and it's gone straight to their heads, studiously avoiding looking at anyone? This is what we see with Hagar. But before we judge those people, let's bear in mind that if we were in their situation, we'd probably be the same. We all have much to learn. Verse 5, then Sarai said to Abram, this is all your fault. I put my servant into your arms, but now that she's pregnant, she treats me with contempt. The Lord will show who's wrong, you or me. See Sarai's jealousy here. She's angry with Abram, despite the situation working out exactly as she'd planned. And see the seed of bitterness. She, she resents this. And hey, we can completely understand that. It doesn't seem fair. This seed of bitterness will grow over the next four years. In chapter 18, verse 12, after the angelic messengers say she'll fall pregnant within a year, there's a bitter note to her laugh. But Sarai also has a point. She blames Abram, and clearly he holds some of the responsibility here. Hagar didn't fall pregnant all on her own, did she? And Abram hasn't ruled in his own household. He's allowed an intolerable situation to develop between Hagar and Sarai. And he's failed to comfort his wife, to give her the support she's needed in her childless grief. And it gets worse. Verse 6. Abram replied, look, she is your servant, so deal with her as you see fit. Then Sarai treated Hagar so harshly that she finally ran away. I mean, look at this cowardly reaction from Abram. You deal with it. How quickly he abandons Hagar, despite having taken her as an additional wife, and she was already under his care and protection. And there's apparent lack of compassion for either of these women, both of whom are now in a genuine crisis. And that's the end of our passage. Kind of ending on a low note, isn't it? And woven through these passages, we see our lessons. That in our fallenness, we fail to trust sovereign God, and there are consequences. No one comes out of this story smelling of roses. Sarai fails to trust God. She tempts Abram to doubt God. She abuses Hagar. Abram doubts God. He allows Hagar to goad and belittle Sarai. And he implicitly facilitates Sarai's abuse of Hagar. And there's Hagar. She becomes swollen with pride. And she ungratefully turns on Sarai. We're not victim blaming here. These were difficult circumstances and that doesn't always bring out the best in people. We're just seeing that they were human, like us. And we, we see throughout the Genesis account, they were used by God as we are, even though we're fallen. And that's the hope, isn't it? You know, the way God's Grace and transformative power work together so that unworthy people, like us, receive the complete forgiveness brought by Jesus Christ and actually become important players in his master plan. Us. He's so gracious. And so we come to the part of the sermon that honestly made me quite nervous. The human drama here revolves around childlessness, barrenness, the yearning for a child, an heir, and all the implications that arise when this hope, this longing goes unfulfilled for so many years, for decades. What do I know about that? 
I've no personal experience and I don't want to be insensitive. We don't want to be Job's comforters, you know, saying, hey, this is what the Bible says, so you should be okay now. In our passage today, Sarai, Abram, and Hagar, none of them were okay. Notice how the text recognizes God's complete sovereignty over conception, pregnancy, and childbirth. Sarai says, the Lord has prevented me from having children. The Lord. There may be a sense in which she's just blaming God, blaming anyone, rather than feel like it's her fault, and of course it's not her fault. But she says, and I think she's right, that God is involved here. This is his plan. The plan they swerved away from. Imagine if this incident hadn't occurred. That Sarai hadn't deviated from the plan, stepped off God's path. There would today be, probably, no Arab-Israeli conflict. That's huge. I mean, we humans would inevitably have found a different way to mess things up. But in Palestine, at least, in Israel, there could have been real peace. So God is sovereign over conception, pregnancy, and childbirth. But then why? I don't really know, but we see the grief and anguish of the humans in this story. The Bible doesn't shy away from that. Real people real crisis. We don't pat these characters on the head and say, they're there, trust God, and it'll all be okay. That's the sense of insensitivity we're trying to avoid. The heartbreak is real. And after all, God has promised. So why isn't he coming through? And children are a gift from God. The Bible tells us this Time and time again. For example, in Psalm 127. Psalm 127, verses 3 to 5a. Children are a gift from God. They are a reward from him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. And we think, so they're a gift. And the Lord will withhold no good thing from those who do what is right. Yes, yes. Psalm 84.11. So why is God withholding this good gift? But we also know that the Lord gives. The Lord. And he takes away. It's his will. Job 1.21. The godly man Job, having lost just about everything, says this. He said, I came naked from my mother's womb, and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. Now that probably is the most offensive passage you can quote to a couple who are trying to conceive. Unless the Holy Spirit has specifically told you to do it, my advice is hang on to that one. I only mention it today because this is a sermon in which I have the luxury of saying many related things. And we are not going to fixate on that scripture. Just note it and keep going. We need the whole counsel of God on this subject. Doctors, medicine are a gift from God too. If you know that God has called you to natural parenthood, I see no reason why you should ignore all the many amazing Modern advances we have in fertility. All that's become possible because of the gifts of knowledge, understanding, creativity, problem solving, tenacity, and intelligence God himself has given to so many medically inclined people. There's a lot that can be done now to help in this area. As long as, like any other area of our life, we pursue it in submission and obedience to Jesus. There's the rub. Matthew 9, 12, Jesus said, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. Jesus is okay with doctors. 
And we're going to pull on that thread a bit harder in a moment and talk about IVF. But there's one more thing to say about parenthood before we move on. It's from a scripture that, in my experience, isn't normally quoted on this subject. But I sense the profound, loving heart of God here. And I know it will be a blessing. John 19, 26 to 27. You might want to turn to this one. John 19, 26 to 27. Jesus is hanging on the cross. He's in the process of dying an excruciating death. The Son of God is in bad shape. And here we see, oh, this is gorgeous. Here we see one of the strongest pieces of evidence we have, other than the cross itself, of how much Jesus loves us and cares about us and empathizes with us. Jesus sees one of his beloved friends, the disciple John, who wrote this gospel so we know it happened. And we see Jesus' much-loved mother, Mary. And Jesus knows what they're going through and what they're about to go through when the unthinkable happens and the Son of God dies. When the unthinkable happens to Mary and her firstborn, miraculous son, passes away. He knows their present and future pain, and he says this. Wow. John 19, 26 to 27. When Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved, he said to her, Dear woman, here is your son. And he said to this disciple, Here is your mother. And from then on, this disciple took her into his home. If the Son of God tells you, that's your mother. If Christ himself says, that's your child. Surely, surely, that's the strongest and most real parenthood that can ever exist. John, that lady is now your true mother. Mary, that man, he's your boy. Do you see that? Lord, open our eyes to your goodness, to the fact that all is not lost. It's never lost with you. Having children is a divinely creative process in which God participates with us. Jesus participated in the creation of a brand new mother-son relationship as one of his last miracles before his death and resurrection. And I think we see that as he shares in all our sufferings, he shares in the grief of barrenness. So then, IVF. This can be a bit of a hot potato inside and outside Christian circles. In vitro fertilization, as most will know, is the medical process of taking a, a woman's egg and a man's sperm and combining them outside the womb in the hope of successful fertilization. And a fertilized egg can then be implanted into the womb and carried to term. Why are we talking about this in a sermon? It's my strong conviction that God is concerned with every aspect of our lives. And he's given us, through the Bible, through Jesus, and through the gift of the Holy Spirit, everything we need to point ourselves in the direction of wise, moral, godly choices in everything we do. And God cares deeply about conception, pregnancy, Children, mothers, our health and welfare. We see this consistently through the Bible and through our experiences. He's a loving, concerned, perfect father. And we know from the creation of Adam and Eve onwards, he's personally part of the process of creating life. Jeremiah 1.5, God's speaking to Jeremiah and he says, 
I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophets to the nations. Psalm 139, 13 to 14, David says this, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. God is the ultimate life giver. So if we do anything in the area of conception, we know we're in territory that irrevocably belongs to God. And this includes when people who don't know God come together to try to conceive. This is his business. There are several views about IVF among God-fearing Christians. Um, this variety of views is not least because the Bible doesn't talk about IVF. It hadn't been invented. So our starting point has to be the same as with any other topic when the Bible's not explicit. The starting position must always be submission to God. Your will be done. But some of us are perhaps still wondering why Rob's going on about IVF. Well, there are implications. IVF is expensive. Even if couples receive free IVF via the, the NHS, it has to be paid for and it's costly. And it's grueling. Ask anyone who's gone through it. People you know, I mean, don't just go up to random strangers and ha say, hey, can you tell me about your IVF journey? Because it's not only grueling, it's sensitive, and for most people, it's highly personal. Expensive, grueling, sensitive, personal. It's also controversial, or it can be. If we were to take all the IVF procedures ever conducted, I think you would find a significant proportion involve the destruction, abandonment, or long-term freezing of embryos. Whatever your position is on when life begins, this isn't morally neutral. I would personally find it impossible from Scripture to argue anything other than that life begins at conception when God partners in this event and breathes life into the fertilization process. But not all Christians take that view. Whatever the case, as sons and daughters of God responsible to him for all our actions and choices, at the very least we can't be blasé, careless about this. That said, where IVF is successful, parents are rightly delighted. A new life comes into being, a ch their child, and this is a wonderful thing before God. And there are ways, even for people who believe life begins at conception, to maintain purity. A couple may decide to use only a minimum amount of eggs and to implant all fertilized eggs so there's no destruction or freezing of embryos. Or the couple can choose to donate fertilized eggs to other couples who may be having even more serious fertility problems. Please believe me when I say that none of this is to bring pressure or condemnation on anyone. We want to seek God's will, learn of him together, accept his forgiveness, and grow into mature children of God. There's a helpful article on this by the Gospel Coalition, How IVF Can Be Morally Right. Search for Gospel Coalition, How IVF Can Be Morally Right, and you'll find it. And if you're struggling in this area, really, or you have questions or concerns about anything we've talked about today, please don't stay silent. We want to care for you. We do care for you. We want to walk together. We want to see God's purposes fulfilled. 
And we know that those purposes for many people include children through a variety of routes. We can't answer every question in this life. I am at least as confused and befuddled as everyone else. But if you want to talk further, just grab anyone you've seen leading today and we can prayerfully muddle through together. You know, in the story of Job, God never explains to Job why he suffers. He could easily have told him about Satan's challenge when Satan says to God, Job only serves you because you've blessed him. God could have told Job how he then allowed Satan to prove himself wrong. He could have mentioned to Job that his story would be an inspiration to millions for thousands of years to come. But no, God expects Job to trust him. He expects us all to trust him. And that's the real challenge of Hagar's story, that God is sovereign and we must trust him that we are fallen and there are consequences when we fail to trust him. But there's always hope too. Hope in God's provision. Hope as God works all things together for good for those who love him. Hope for those who accept God's ultimate plan revealed through God's own son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Thanks be to him. If you need to talk or pray today, there are some people you can go to, some elders and then some shady guy. I'm happy to talk. We all are. Um, You may find it more appropriate to speak with someone of the other gender, and that's fine too. We can arrange that. And let's pray now. Lord God, we know that your heart is never to condemn us. Your heart is to bring us into all truth and to set us free. Lord, and some of the things that we learn and understand of you are hard, they are difficult, they're hard to accept sometimes. But we know that you are good, and because we know you are good, we can follow you. So help us, Lord, in our fallen state to reach to you, to accept the work that the Holy Spirit does with us, to look to the cross, to our Savior. Help us to trust, Lord. Amen.